A word to the wise. We are an explicit podcast tackling content with adult themes as well as entering spoiler territory if you haven't caught up with us. That point for us would be through chapter 35 of Iron Gold, the fourth installment of the Red Rising trilogy. Yeah, I said that. <laughs> the first book of the second trilogy of Red Rising. You know what I'm saying. Hey there, this is Cross. And I'm PJ. <laughs> and I'm doing my best not to laugh really hard. <laughs> you were talking a minute ago. And we are Words and Whiskey, a podcast for veteran and novice readers alike. We tackle fiction novels and love to talk about what you're drinking. You should think of us as your intoxicating weekly book club. You know what, Crossland? I am tired because as all of you listeners might be able to hear... I'm not sure how it's going to come through in the edit or the mastering or whatever, but I have a new puppy in the house and I have been up every few hours taking him potty. So, you know, I'm going to blame it on that. Again, you've done this to yourself. <laughs> He's cute. It's worth it. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right well <clears throat> i'll take your word for it also barely like very rarely have we heard anything else because your microphone does such a good job isolating locally so mm -hmm. so today is our sixth episode covering iron gold by pierce brown and we are going to talk about chapters 30 through 35 we'll be talking about everyone's favorite smarmy badass apollonius along with a lot of other things you actually right, said his name right you, this time I just I did that once earlier, PJ. I just you've messed been, it up the one time. You've been time. fucking up his name every time we've been talking. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> but first, let's talk about what we're drinking. What are you having? The website where I got this recipe from just calls it guava rum. So, you know, guava rum. It's an ounce and a half of rum. It actually calls for uh, pineapple infused rum. I didn't have that. So I just put a few pieces of pineapple into the shaker. So... An ounce and a half of rum, three quarters of an ounce of lime juice, half an ounce of Cointreau, and four ounces of guava juice. And as I said, I shook that with a couple pineapple chunks and then uh, poured it over a nice circular ice cube because I have those now, Crossland. You're not alone anymore. Oh. Garnished it with a lime wheel. It's really good. Nice. A lot of guava. Guava. Hides the rum very well. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. What, are, uh, what are you chasing that with? Uh, I'm chasing it with a beer that we are both drinking, which is the final oh, beer, we? the final beer from our good friend, Logan. It is Ennegrin's Dunkel, Munich style Dunkel Lager. And one of my favorite styles, I love, I love traditional German styles, but Dunkel's have a really sweet spot in my heart and it's really, really well done. I'm really excited about sipping on this for the rest of the show. Yeah, I've, I've already tried it as well and I really, really dig it. Mm -hmm. It's very good. But I know what you're drinking as far as beer goes, but what are you drinking liquor wise? Well, I'm actually having two drinks. I have two drinks lined up for this episode. One is really just a, an appropriate send off for a certain part of the story. I've got a little pour of Lock of Alone 12 here for when uh, when Darrow's got the bottle as his bedside. And <laughs> with that, I also have a gin and tonic made with this wonderful aged gin from End of Days Distillery. Classic GNT, nothing special, just a just a good mainstay. But the flavor of this gin is so good that you know I I had to do it. Yeah, and the log of Ulan, of course, paying homage to our man Lorne. Yep, dead guy yep. Lorne, dead guy Lorne, the goat, as uh, Pierce <laughs> Brown himself has said. Because <laughs> because uh, he, he eats everything, old I, iron sides. I mean, you could say that. You could say that's why. I don't think it is. <laughs> with that let's get into last week's <laughs> predictions that, i'm not so, i'm not off base right he was called ironsides because he like ate yeah. everything right uh he ate rocks yeah much like rocks. goats right well I, yeah but he isn't called the old goat sides now is he <laughs> no you're right all right <laughs> <laughs> old goats goat are that crazy to eat <laughs> old goat sides <laughs> or already being ridiculous right off the bat holy yeah, shit it's gonna We're be fucked. a good week 
Oh, man. Okay. So <laughs> last week's predictions. The question, I mean, are we going to talk about this one? Yep. All right. So, PJ, what's the most valuable thing in the world to steal that Mustang. Ephraim is going after? I said Mustang. That Ephraim, you I, said Mustang. I'm right. I'm sure of it. <laughs> I just, you know, like this isn't technically resolved right now. But So do I get to put in another guess? No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> but we're gonna, we, we just had to mention it because it's not... Should should I drink for this one now or should we wait until it actually gets resolved? I think we should wait until it actually gets resolved. Because I might I just wanna... hold out hope that I'm still right. I mean, do you hold out hope that you're still right? Maybe. You don't know me. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we'll move on from that one. No drinks awarded. Pushing it to next week. What happens to Cassius and Lysander, now the guests of Dido Al Raw? I think Lysander brings up the bombing and expresses a similar distrust of the official story. And the answer there, of course, is no. They're <laughs> much more like glorified prisoners at this point. Yeah. Yeah. That's a drink. Uh, what happens when the Minotaur wakes up was the next question. Also, by the way, you're posing these questions to yourself. I know. Okay. It makes <laughs> it even worse now. <laughs> He better be chained down and chained down again because this bitch is going to be going to want some blood. And uh, he's fine. He's they pretty like chill. Literally let him out. He, he's really <laughs> chill when they when he wakes up. He's playing his phantom violin. Just yeah. just kind of hanging out, being a dude, saying things. Mm -hmm. so, Lots of saying things. Just kind of rants. He talks a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, literally. No. So take a drink. OK. Oh, well, I mean, fine. And does word of Lyria's near arrest make it to Cavax? You said. Yes, but he just kind of brushes it off. We don't know that's not true. We're going with no, though, because I feel like it would have been brought up. Mm. You know? Fine. Yeah. That's a drink. All right. All right. I think that's everything, right? That is everything for these predictions. I just had a little tiny burp, so I had to let that go. <laughs> <laughs> had to check if it was vomit, you know? So with that, let's get into the chapters. <laughs> Always a worry with you. It is yeah. <laughs> our, our breakdown here. We start with chapter 30, which is with Darrow. And the title is the Nessus, which is the ship we're going to be taking. What do you make of the howlers and their various reactions to freeing Apple from prison? Do you think Darrow is doing a good job hiding how much this pains him? I don't think he's actually trying to hide it so much as just kind of put on a stoic face. I think he and all the howlers feel the same way and know that they all feel the same way that they are kind of committing an atrocity in order to meet their uh, ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. He's mostly trying to keep his mind on task. Okay. Apple is the means to the end, which is the death of the Ash Lord. Okay. Does that make sense? He's, he's the mean. Yeah, no, it does. It does. It definitely does. Okay. It's just interesting too, especially when you consider when you start to like tie in the meaning of the name Nessus, which we went over previously is the centaur that ended up leading to Darrow's, or I mean, oops, uh, <laughs> didn't, Freudian slip, Hercules <laughs> death. Um, oh, Jesus. oh, I, I haven't forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think, I think that those intertwine well, of course, you know, I mean, it, it feels very on the nose. I think it's even crazier that what centaur is half man, half horse minotaur, similarly half man, half bull. Hmm. Yeah, that's I good. think there's good there's that line. also. Darrow is going yeah. to get slapped with that cock. <laughs> More of the bull penis. <laughs> well, I mean, we've seen everything else of his. It hasn't been described as anything other than bull like. So wow. Until <laughs> until that happens, I'm going to go with that's what it is. We also get a brief snapshot <laughs> discussing the Nessus and its build versus that of these society ships. And we also now know that uh, Phobos is now a shipyard. You know, we, we get like a lot of like little tiny contextual things, of course, but good for Phobos being a, Phobos being a shipyard. deserves so much more than being a glorified parking lot, Crossland. I don't know that that's true. Mm -hmm. justice for phobos to me was never phobos should live for more it was more why the fuck do we call this thing a moon because like you know 
So it, we just need to it, feed it more. It's good so it that grows. it's a glorified. <laughs> Jesus, feed it more moon rocks, pile yeah. them on. Yeah. What is this Minecraft? It could be if you want it to be. <laughs> no, no. How have we got off the rails this quickly already? <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I'm in a weird mood. All right, fair point. But I, I mean, you you raised a fair point on the glorified parking lot bit. I guess it is interesting that they've changed. It was effectively a weird like jail city, but production place into this new shipyard. You know, what I mean, I think it's a good change, of course, and it makes sense. It's the smallest, most worthless thing in the, you know, the Republic solar system. So, how far away is Phobos from the rim? As far as Mars is. But like a little bit more closer. I'm just trying to figure what, out. What are you? What are you trying to get at? I'm trying yeah. to figure out if the Rim Lords are using Phobos as a ship production facility. Secretly I couldn't sh- imagine shipping them over to the. No, because that would rim. that that totally wouldn't work. Yeah, you're right. Because that would be crossing the Paxilium. Like it just wouldn't happen. Hmm. Unless you're suggesting that Quicksilver is playing all sides of the war. Well, which, why wouldn't he be? Well, I don't know. I think that he <laughs> he believes that he wasn't really thriving under the previous system even if he also thinks he isn't thriving under the current system i mean you know he's a pure capitalist right yeah what untapped market than somebody who just had their entire shipyard destroyed you know it's fair (laughs) i guess that is that is an untapped market they could definitely use it i mean that is i also slam dunk as far as business plans go of course of course the The conversation between Kieran and Darrow is refreshing as well until they bring in Rona. And that adds this interesting layer of dynamic of family plus station uh, in, you know, inside of the army and inside of the howlers. What do you make of the little firebrand as well as Darrow's decision to leave both of them behind? So I love her. I think she's great. And I think it's kind of a misstep on Darrow's part to not be celebrating how much enthusiasm she has for his cause. I think it's completely understandable that he went along with Kieran's wishes, but I could see this being a problem for everyone. Rona gets pissed that she doesn't get to go along with something she's absolutely qualified for and wants to participate in. And if the information that Darrow is keeping people back on the means of nepotism to keep them safe, that's going to kind of risk his respect amongst the howlers. So... Not that they disagree necessarily, but the fact that those scruples are in question would be that's a problem. Interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way, especially from the pointer perspective that there is something maybe nepotistic about it. I feel like most of the people that we know on the ship are crucial or necessary in a specific way. You know, we know that there are only 24 that are going along in total, including the 10 people that are the other people that were liberated from deep grave which baddies right Mm -hmm. and then you also have apollonius himself who's one so that leaves you 13 spots and we know that most of them are golds or the one exception that i think that we know of immediately is callaway and winkle right i think those Mm -hmm. are the two exceptions that we know were there any other like crew members of the ship strictly crew members or are they all kind of no i think it's running just those 24 that's why later they recognize that there's 25 Right. I I know there's that many people. I just didn't know if there was a crew dedicated to the ship that wasn't part of their operations that was in that counting. Not in this case. Okay. Because this is this is very clearly there's a strict count of 24 people on the ship. No crew like that. That is the crew. It's just, you know, it's a strike force. I'm imagining a very large ship. (laughs) This one is not so big. This is this one's not so big. Okay. this this ship is like a a decent sized ship but it's luxurious more than anything and fast yeah yeah i would call it more of like a pleasure yacht it it, it is a fast ship it's not a nothing legendary it's not the packs you know you you wouldn't need to fully equip it it's not a kilometer long war destroyer of of doom and doom and more doom more doom (laughs) more doom but it is you know it is indeed a ship okay Getting back into it, I think that your point about Rona in particular is interesting. I just think that I also see Darrow's perspective from being just a leader and removing the familial tie and being like, why would we bring a red when we're going to go confront golds and we need, you know, 
people with the immediate skill sets you don't match the skill set goodbye plus kieran's wishes kieran's wishes now kieran leaving kieran behind feels to me like the nepotistic thing because he is probably more useful he was the leader of a different task force though he was the leader of a different battalion that's not there with him so i didn't see that as a problem of him not coming because he he's needed elsewhere as the leader of a different faction fair true it's interesting to me that pierce doesn't cut off the chapter after darrow slides into his bed i i think that that moment that like long two paragraph stretch is such a profound visual image it's so well done you can imagine it on screen you can imagine the way that that's shot and i i just love it smelling the sea thinking of lorne the log of Ulan 16 on the dresser or on the side table the photo of pax and mustang and then like him breaking down privately it's just a strong moment i think an interesting yeah. question to ask here is how do you think darrow's ability to trust others over time has changed and why do you think he still chooses to hide his emotions from others? A couple things. There was a, there was a lot there that I want to address. First, yeah. drink your log. Oh, of yeah. Yep. That's, that's what this is here for. Yep. While you're exactly. talking. Secondly, I think I'm with you that it came, seems kind of weird that that wasn't the end of the chapter, but I think it makes sense that he needed to include the scene of the support howlers leaving mm-hmm. because he didn't want that to be the beginning of the next chapter with Darrow. I think I think that's a good it's a frustrating way to end it. But you kind of need that visualization of like, all right, Rona's leaving hypothetically. So I don't I I agree. I think it would have been stronger to end it in the bedroom, but whatever. Then there was his ability to trust changing over time. I think I think he's starting to trust others a little bit more, specifically the howlers. I think he gives them a lot more autonomy i still think he doesn't really trust anyone else and he certainly doesn't trust himself and i think that's why he's breaking down that's interesting i i think you're right that he doesn't generally trust himself to make the right decisions all the time which is also why he reflects on kind of and has these memories of lorne and just kind of the surety i think because it kind of evokes that same sort of strength and confidence and you know it's kind of the the person that he's aspired to be for most of his life at the very Mm -hmm. least not in every way but in a number of ways that is his mental model for what he feels like he wants to be or what he feels like he should be i i think that you raise a good point in terms of the other howlers and i think that he has gotten better at delegating and i think that's why i tried to separate this question so like he is willing to trust in certain things in matters of the mission in matters of autonomy, like you said, in giving people different components. But he still doesn't trust people emotionally. He doesn't have these emotional conversations as openly or as readily. We get a little bit of this later in the next chapter, but it's just a brief glimpse. And it's like, dude, you need, you need fucking therapy. You need to fucking talk to someone about this shit. Do you think that's also a product of Lauren, though? Just him trying to take on the base ideals of stoicism a little bit too hard that could be the case the only thing that i would counter there is that like lauren was pretty open with his emotions even then like he told him his insecurities and his wishes and like the things that he wished that he didn't do and maybe that's just the wisdom of age you know getting into a little bit of a quote later from apollonius (laughs) the books of youth with the wisdom of age but yeah i think that the the point here that you made though a little bit ago is that Darrow might be taking it too seriously. But also, I think that this also shows that Darrow hasn't really changed that much. I mean, he had emotional levers that he could pull, especially in Mustang when she was around all the time, to kind of have these conversations. And that just doesn't exist right now. And that's why also, like, the picture of the bet, like, the picture next to him. But he also hasn't found other people to confide in, really. And he just, like, hasn't... I don't know, despite being surrounded by friends, he still treats himself as this idolized reaper, maybe in his own head, maybe externally holding up that guy so that he can be the symbol for the Republic. But I believe this character. I believe it's real. I believe all of this. And I I have no actual qualms or problems. I just also I like shake my head at Darrow being like, dude, how did you not realize that like you need to open up with your friends more? How did you not realize that you can talk to other people about this more? And it's moments like these where I'm like, 
you literally had your brother there. <laughs> you you yeah. could talk with him about the difficulty of, of your situation because he knows his daughter literally like wants to go to war with you. He understands. He's lost people. He's lost the same people. Do you think he views his his him opening up to other people as a burden on them and he doesn't want to burden them with his his shit? I kind of feel like it's more duty. I don't think it's like I feel like he feels the need to create this immaculate guise again like he did before but this time it's because he's a symbol of the republic previously it was to protect his identity now it's because he is the symbol of freedom in the republic this the reaper idolized so he can't show any cracks in the armor so interesting point there i think where we see him most vulnerable in this entire series has been with the jackal i think yeah i think there's several Kind of. He still hasn't really opened up that much with Severo. I, I'm thinking Maybe. in particular two different moments with Severo, but yeah. Yeah, there are a couple in of very Golden specific Sun and moments. Star, but but yeah. where I'm going with this is, do you think he could use adversaries as a way of <laughs> cathartically opening up to somebody, almost like a serial killer? And do you think he does that with this with Apollonius? I, I don't disagree with that at all, actually. <laughs> That's a good point. Because he kind of does. He kind of enjoys it. He, he, you know, he's not like, it's not like he's opening up and talking about the fact that he's not a father with Apollonius or that he's not a good father with Apollonius. He's not talking to anyone about that. He should be. But he does find some catharsis in that. And that's seen a little bit later with Apollonius. There's a lot of like, I know that the goblin, <laughs> I think this is the time when he calls him the goblin. I know the goblin is remembering Cassius in this moment or what have you when they're considering freeing the Minotaur. And, you know, how the men are fundamentally different. That, to me, is another read of Darrow not being fully honest with his thoughts with Severo, because he would have fully detailed this out with Severo, like had that conversation to make sure, make sure that they were like on the level. And meanwhile, Severo is paranoid thinking about this the whole time. Clearly, like that's part of the reason (laughs) he was staying in bed in addition to like just wanting to see and missing his kids, you know, gets his wife. Anyway, we'll talk about that more when we get to it, but Man, fucking Darrow, how have you not learned to open up to people, dude? <sighs> yeah. So Idiot. then, yeah, agreed. And then the Nessus sets off for the core, for Venus. Mm-hmm. So that we get into chapter 31 with Ephraim, chapter Kites. I have to mention this. We just have to talk about it because the revelation here is a wonderful one. And it was one that I honestly, I thought that you might pick up on. And might like piece it together. The hard part is I don't want to point out things, right? Mm-hmm. But I do want to kind of guide you through it. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to lead you into something or into understanding exactly what something is or leaning into predicting this because that would be pointless. This is about you experiencing the series. But there are times when I am also flabbergasted that you don't pick it up. And so I'm sitting here <laughs> going like, oh, OK, um, shit. Uh, I was expecting to talk about this like because I won't put it strictly in the notes because I don't want you to know (laughs) and it just doesn't come up. It doesn't happen and I don't have to like rebut an argument about it. And this is one of those things where you not catching that Ephraim was Philippe was a conversation that I expected to have last week to some degree to like dissuade you a little bit from it being Ephraim. But so what what hints were there that it was other than him being gay and a gray? So the whole the identical fiance story like literally identical well but the, it was vague enough that it, it did make me think about it like i asked so their thought about the parallels but i it in my mind there wasn't a reason for him to be in disguise so it, it never crossed my mind mm-hmm. totally right which is also it also this one also caught me off guard the first time for the record like 100 percent in your boat when it cut over to this chapter, I was like, oh, fuck, you're kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> the other points in reflection and rereading this as well are when Lyria is walking the fox, the gray and the red that are watching her from the other side that are having the conversation on the other side of the fence. Yep. It's also Dano and Ephraim. But uh, they weren't watching her, though. They were no, they're she having was a watching conversation them. while observing her. Yeah. But- so they were clearly like watching her to some degree. And trying to draw attention to see if there was a way that they could get in. Yeah. 
And then, of course, like Dano stealing and setting up, setting up Lyria. And that's okay. Like, I also, I'm not, I'm not trying to shitpost you here at all. My question is, I just want to know about your feelings about the revelation and this whole, this whole like thing coming out where all of a sudden it's like, oh shit, these genuinely like good, like happy moments are actually corrupt, fraudulent. (laughs) Yeah. So my question here and my thought here. As soon as I, as soon as they mention the word rabbit, I think I'm like, oh fuck. All right. Mm-hmm. Now I understand what's going on. But my first sort of rush of thoughts was how many of those people were in their employ in mm-hmm. that scene. And I'm inclined to think that it's everybody, including the gold woman, including the other grays. Like I, I think the entire crowd was a setup. I'm going with, I don't think it was the other grays or the God, what was the other colored woman? Not the gold, but the, there's like a green, I think. Was it a green? Cause if it's a green, it would make sense that it's zero, right? Yeah, I think so. I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember either. I just know. I think there were a bunch of colors. Yeah, there were. I was just trying to remember if there was, I think it was else. a green. I, would, I think it was, I think it was a green. Yeah, I think I think that's right. At the very least, off the top of my head, I know that the red is intended to be Dano. I know that the Ephraim is meant to be green. I don't think anything else of that is set up. I just think that Ephraim expected to be able to talk his way out of it because he knows how greys operate. And he's clearly, as mentioned in sort of the these are all of the people in the Ocean's Eleven crew, he is charisma. And that is his character yeah. trait. So... I expected him to be able to talk out of it, especially when you know that it's Ephraim and not this old man, Felipe, mm-hmm. which you didn't know. You don't know until now. I highly recommend reader reading that chapter if you haven't, oh, I'm because going it, to is, it, it yeah. plays so differently. All of the conversations just peel back this extra layer of expert manipulation of craftsmanship from Pierce, learning how to also deceive us better. By the way, with multiple POVs, to me, this feels like redemption for the like Severo trick where we actually witnessed the magic and then we get the reveal of what the magic trick is. You know, like it it's great. It's great. Yeah. So, yeah, this this to me in every way is just a fantastic pair of scenes. Yeah. It's nice that you get the like longer chapter break between point A and point B that way you don't know right away, but yeah. Well, I mean, I had a week yeah, well, yeah, you, you know what I mean. <laughs> in in theory, there's a break, so it's not like it's paid off right away in the other direction. But right. yeah, did you have any other thoughts on the uh, Ephraim Philippe thing? Not yet. I think there are some more things to point out later, but not yet. Sure, sure. And and that also colors this entire chapter, right? Because after this, um, after the initial interaction that we get with Kavachi, we basically move into Ephraim being Philippe, sometimes even talking in third person about Philippe, which is also interesting. Yeah. And I have to maybe attribute that to the Zolodone. Like, I I'm think not entirely kind of that plus acting like he's intentionally acting plus the Zolodone. It's interesting. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. I, I think Zolodone is the main thing, but that hinders any sort of empathy. Right. Mm-hmm. And method acting. I would think is pretty rooted in empathy in a way, which I think is why he's also kind of just narrating his way through it. Right. You know, so. that that makes sense to me. But before they leave kibachis, before we get to the, you know, the rest of the, the scene here, I need you to do the exercise that Philippe does. Oh, fuck you. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I've had it. I haven't heard this. Good, good fucking luck. I don't even know how to pronounce that word. All right. What the fuck? <laughs> All right. A pedestrian's penchant for circulum circumambulatory locomotion is the pedantic paroxysm of pleonasm <laughs> <laughs> peremptory drives and sometimes leads to imperfectly preventable parasite. Fuck you. Okay. So he says he says it four times. Um, I'm not doing that. <laughs> no, good work. Good work. I just thought, with, with all the comments we made about like reading and like reading out loud, it's, it's just, it's irresistible. So circum, so. circumambulatory peroxy, paroxysm. No, it's not. It's Prox, paroxysm, paroxysm, per, paroxysm. Yeah. Paroxysm. It's gotta be paroxysm. Wouldn't there be I think that's why he does it because the it's pair oxyism. 
Paroxysm. I don't know. I hate that. Pleonasm. I hate you, and I hate that. <laughs> a pedestrian's penchant for circumambulatory. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that one's hard. Cir- circum. Wow. That one is the Circumambulatory. Hardest. Circumambulatory. Yes. Circum. A pedestrian's penchant for circumambulatory locomotion is the pedantic paroxysm of a pleonism of parent preemptory drivers and sometimes leads to imperfectly preventable parasite that specifically the of a pleonism to of peremptory drivers is just such a different mouthfeel than the rest of it that plean yeah. pleonasm right pleonasm yeah wow gross mm, yeah well I we quit. did it I hate you. (laughs) So the kites to me provide fantastic imagery, especially when Ephraim provides his story about the winner take all nature of the contest on Mercury. It's interesting because it feels like the real Ephraim is coming out of Felipe a bit here, even more so obviously with a comment about Volga, but more to the point that people cut each other down in order to make life there is in society that's that's sort of the the ritual of life is to perpetually be you know the number one kite and you're always taking out other people as we found out over the course of this week that is exactly what Ephraim plans to do here is cut down lyria's high-flying childlike kite first of all battle kites seem fucking sweet i feel like i've heard of that before like in in real life yeah it's a thing in the middle east it, it um, might might be in other cultures too, but uh, great book. There, uh, why can't I remember the name? Yeah, you. I'll I, remember it in a second. It, I think it was a book we read in high school or something. It was definitely a book that I read in high school, but I've reread it since. I own it. Well, I just don't remember the name. I haven't. I read it in high school. Uh, <laughs> I think it was a really cool conversation, and it, it's obviously supposed to be a deeper meaning than the 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 surface literal meaning of it. But it's it's beautiful and simple and it's it's likening people to kites for whatever reason makes a whole lot of sense to me because for the most part they're kind of in their own lane strictly interacting with what's around them and not getting the full picture of the rest of the kites in the area they can see the ground and they can see where they came from but they can't necessarily see what's around them i don't know what that means i just thought it was beautiful but yeah i think it's like they're they're fragile they're really really fragile and it's easy to cut them down if need be yeah the the other thing that i would just like add a little bit there is the you a that's that's a great description and it really kind of colors it in an interesting way especially if you consider if we start to tie together that metaphor with everyone the thing that i find uh troubling and interesting here is that ephraim is also very cognizant with what he's doing and he's trying to like set Lyria's expectations a little bit here even and that makes for very a very interesting scene that they find themselves wrapped up in you know like he knows that he's going to have to let her down hard and so he is cutting her down right now with with kind of this information just to give her some sense of something to go off of in the future and a sense of understanding of what's going to happen to her right now right which yeah uh, that seems risky any sort of hint seems risky well right so does mentioning volga outright fucking well, idiot there's that <laughs> thankfully covers by saying she's dead but you know yeah but that's uh that's a loose end if lyria ends up surviving this True, true. That would be a that would be a loose end for sure. Yeah, something at the very least in her brain that she can think about. So Ephraim's reflection on Trig here throughout the chapter draws an interesting comparison to me. The way Daryl watches Trig get cut down initially in that scene, and the way that Ephraim consumes that scene from the other side of the perspective, seeing Aja cut through and seeing like Darrow cower is interesting and the way that he kind of rewinds and replays that scene is very very similar to the hall of it that radicalized darrow in the beginning of golden sun even more so to the point trig seems to evoke eo as an interesting comparison what do you what do you make what do you think so obviously there's a lot of parallel like you're pointing out i think it's in both cases in both of those videos darrow is entirely powerless of doing anything which true i think is worth mentioning but maybe doesn't matter to ephraim that much but there's 
on top of that, the comparison of the changes that each person has gone through since the death of their loved ones. At least Ephraim is constantly talking about how, what would Trigg think of this? What would Trigg say if he saw this going on right now? And Darrow obviously has constant crises through the first trilogy with EO and who she is truly, what she would think, what he would think if he went back and saw her now. Like there's a focusing on the past through the video, but then there's also the focusing on their dead loved ones and how things have changed, Mm -hmm. which makes for a really cool comparison. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess the, the stakes couldn't be more different between the two of them, of course, but I think that the personal stakes feel very similar to the two of them. The difference is, is that unlike Darrow, Ephraim hasn't came to terms with the idea of like living for more because that was never a conversation that was had. It was never something where he was put into a position where he had power and could use that power to do something more or better. Instead, he's basically a drone that has to suffer through with this memory like Darrow would if he wouldn't have done something or said something and gotten himself hung too. And I think that's not necessarily because of the con- the conversation that was had with Darrow and not had with Ephraim, but I think it's because Ephraim is not allowing any sort of emotion to, cl- to guide him when it comes mm-hmm. to anything with Trigg. He is actively and explicitly numbing any sort of emotion. And Darrow is entirely motivated by emotional thoughts of eo through at least through the first book yeah yeah and to even more to the point on ephraim's side holiday has kind of tried to provide that more to him saying Mm -hmm. like ephraim wouldn't want to see you like live this way and comments like that she's she's tried and so he is actively choosing to ignore even oblique attempts to say live for something more than you know yeah your own numbness Mm mm-hmm it's it's hard hitting, man. Ephraim is well written, deep, and intense. Yeah, very intense. So finally to end the chapter, we see Ephraim as Philippe give Lyria the necklace that was made in Kabachi's lab of Bacchus's face, the pendant that he's been holding close to his chest, a replica, of course. Mm-hmm. It's not the real one. Okay, so that was a question that I had. Why did he have two of them? And I, I was I was curious if one of them, the one that he kept, was a t- contingency plan if he were to get caught. But I think that's actually what I put as one of my predictions for next week. Maybe? Yeah. Yeah, I did. So I was thinking that it was two identical hunter-killer drones. But Got it. Definitely not. Yeah. No, the, the first one, the one that he keeps, is actually a pennant from Trig, huh? Trig. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, that that takes down my uh, my comment there. But I think let's let's look at the description one more time. I wrote it down. Uh, Titanium hunter killer drone with silent engines and a neurotoxin delivery system concealed in their front faceplates. An assassin's machine. So he then asks how small it can be made at the end of the chapter with uh, Kabachi. So now Mm -hmm. we we see basically a necklace size pendant that is this drone so they use the term assassin in the description so that would be a lethal thing presumably but i'm wondering if the neurotoxin in a smaller amount is intended to incapacitate instead or if he's intending to just let everybody on the ship die in the area at least i don't know if i have an answer but that's actually an interesting breakdown Mm -hmm. Uh, is it also an emp then I don't know if it was an EMP so much as it was a bomb, like because there were three drones, although I guess it could have been an EMP because they're falling out of the sky. Correct. That is the only part of this entire chapter that isn't clear to me is what the explosion is, but I think it's the drones. Okay. I think it's the drones exploding against the side of the hull and they're just big, big explosions. All right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess we'll find out soon. Yeah, I would say that this is definitely a question mark left intentionally here for more information a bit later. Mm-hmm. Interesting point, though, on the intention to incapacitate. Hmm. So with that, we move into chapter 32, Lysander the Rending. This chapter to me is a short one because there isn't much of consequence that happens here. But 
it's it's worthwhile because I think it it gives some finality to Cassius and Lysander's relationship a little bit. Like it provides perspective on where they're both at. Mm-hmm. So before we get into that, what do you think about Sungrave and the current state of the Rim? And are are you as surprised as Lysander Cassius that they're doing as well as they have with new ships, new designs, new weapons, uh, not kind of skulking off like Darrow thought they would? I don't know if I'm that surprised. Not as surprised as they were, but it is cool to see that they're making progress. I figured they would accelerate their timeline in some way. They weren't going to be sitting ducks for 50 years. They're going to dedicate as much as much resources as they have to the cause of building up their navy again one question 18 kilometers high as the tallest mountain how tall is that compared to like everest eight kilometers high 18 18 kilometers high and mount everest is 8.8 okay so it's almost exactly twice as tall as everest which is crazy to me this is significantly higher to the yeah. point. It's over double. That's a pretty cool little aspect, but these uh the city of Sungrave is just carved into a giant fucking mountain. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think what's interesting too to like think about Sungrave and Taiki is they're both kind of even just thinking about the two of them, Sungrave is like carved into the side of the mountain, and Taiki is described at the very front of the book as being like hunched in the mountains, like it was hidden. And I think that's interesting to compare those two is like, here's a core planet. Here's a rim planet. (laughs) Here's a rim city. Here's a core city. Right. We obviously didn't get a crazy amount of description, but we got some cool landscape description, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. Let's see. What what other cool stuff is there to talk about? Did you talk about, did you want to talk about the ships at all? The fact that they got the ships? The ships are cool and bigger than expected. Well, didn't we already mention that? Well, we kind of did, but I don't think we did strictly in the context of... Yeah, the ships are cool. They're bigger than expected. (laughs) (laughs) Where where do you think the other docks are? Or what what do you think? How did they... How have they recovered so quickly? I'm thinking that there's maybe... There are other, other moons, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I'm thinking it's probably less of a single centralized dock and more of a conglomerate of small outfits putting together ships and then sending them to a a rally point on EO, IO. Okay. That's my guess. Yeah. That makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. The next scene that we get is Cassius and Lysander hanging out of the bath. There are a couple of pinks around and they're kind of playing the part. And Cassius tries to very coyly, you know, allude to the fact that they need to continue to act as the brothers, Castor and Regulus. What did you make of their acting skills? So it, it feels over the top and it feels so theatrical but then I remember that so are every other conversation that I've ever heard between gold people before. So um, <laughs> I think they're doing a pretty good job. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't I don't disagree. I think what's so interesting between the two of them is that it starts off as obviously initially they're kind of acting, but then the acting becomes real to a certain degree when it comes to the conversations about like lysander being a virgin and sort of the way that that makes him uncomfortable but then also kind of the spiteful conversations and the conversations about home the conversations about like chess versus karachi all of that there's a tinge of of realness where they aren't even necessarily acting except for maybe you know interpreting their home as a different place than they normally would yeah so i I feel like they're mostly telling the truth and they're mostly giving each other shit for things that are actually like true and I think they're just being very selective about what other what information they actually give up. Like ribbing each other for being virgins is not is nothing to like make them that wouldn't give them up. You know, it makes it the the more real they can be, the more it's going to pass, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And of course, given kind of the real components of their conversation, how do you think the two of them have kind of grown apart? You know, I, the last line of this chapter is, is or the final comments on this chapter are very clear about that. 
I have outgrown it, the private world that we share, the Archimedes, and I have even outgrown him. What do you what do you make of Lysander's 20 year old assertion? Well, I think he kind of sees Cassius as a, almost a father figure and he's he's ready to be on his own. He's of a different generation. He sees things in a different way. He thinks differently. He has different hobbies and different aspirations. He feels like more of an intellectual than Cassius does, whereas Cassius seems to be more of the the warrior and jock of the group, even though they both probably have they both probably are better than average on both fronts. It's just he's grown up. He's ready to leave the nest. I think that's kind of where he's coming from with it. That's fair. And I mean, it makes sense as a 20 year old. I mean, we've, we've seen Darrow go through this. We've seen Cassius go through this. You know, it's it's no yeah. there's no doubt there. You know, I don't think there's it, animosity or anything towards Cassius. I think it's just I'm I'm ready to be on my own. I'm ready to uh, move forward with my life in the way that I want to live it. Yeah, I think I agree with that. I wonder if Lysander sees Cassius more as a brother than a father figure. There are obviously elements of that, but I think kind of the way that he feels pestered by him variously over the the little bit that we've seen, I wonder if that stands out more to him in the later years, at the least. It's definitely something in between. It's it's a little bit of both, and that makes for a real weird relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, where Cassius doesn't really have the final word. Cool. Mm. All right. Chapter 33, Alien. What do you make of Dido's coup, and what do you think the other lords will do? I think Dido converts the other lords to be on, being on her side, which is kind of tragic for Romulus, but I think he has led with kind of a strict tone for most of his mm-hmm. life, I would think. Dido seems to have a pretty noble cause that she's moving towards seems to have information on lies told by Romulus. So hear me out and let's uh, let's fuck him over is a pretty good pitch for the other rim lords, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think she converts them to being on her side. Hmm. Okay, cool. You know, I mean, the, the other question that accompanies that, of course, is how do Cassius and Lysander fit into that? But I think that we can kind of answer that question a little bit later here. Yep. Serafina pushing Lysander's sexual tension buttons makes me laugh hysterically the way that she was like, but you were paying attention to me when my shirt was off, like, and you were looking at my abdomen breasts and like you just all these different comments back and forth. What do you make of their sort of entanglement? Do you think it's forced for information or do you think there's something genuine about it? I think she is Chris Hansen to catch a predator in him. I think <laughs> she's trying to bait an adult man to uh, do something untowards to a underage teenage girl who is her. But yeah, because at best she's 16 or 17. Right. Even though Based it says she's that. 20 in here. Yeah, it says uh, all like almost 20 or something like that. I, you or know, just I can't, I barely, it. barely 20. I think it says something like that. Yeah. I and that just doesn't it doesn't line up with the original Morningstar math. No. But. So I mean, she is she is going around saying she's 20 when really she's a teenage girl trying to to catch a predator trap Lysander. Fair. <laughs> One of the things that I want to ask here. So let's just imagine. Let's back up just a second. Let's just imagine not that she's 20. But let's imagine that it's OK in society for people to date a younger age ranges to older age ranges. Given that instead as a basis how would you answer the question? Do you think that there's something genuine there? Or do you think that she's just trying to, I think she's to just catch a predator ish, but like, yeah, okay. Right. I think she's right. just fucking with him. Yeah, totally. But that's not the case. It is to catch a predator. <laughs> I am man. The, the thing for me about Serafina and Lysander's relationship, it, relationship in you're going to call it a relationship now. I'm not actually calling it a relationship. What I mean is that their that dynamic sick piece of shit is trying to fuck a 16 year old Crossland. <laughs> that's not a relationship. These aren't humans. <laughs> <laughs> it's my only comeback. Are they uh, not? Well, this is the whole like homo superior bullshit that the jackal got into or homo oriate, not homo superior, but anyway, with, without that in context, I, I think that Lysander is actually attracted to her, obviously. Well done. And 
she does not give a shit no. and she is very clearly able to pull on his push on his buttons like it's nobody's business pull on his he what just, crossland <laughs> what did i text you earlier today tug on your tiki torch <laughs> I I left so hard and you got no you did oh, not would, respond whatsoever. I uh, laughed very hard at that. I said tugging a little just don't worry about it, just tugging on your tiki torch. Because I hadn't seen anything in the oh, notes I was yet. still working at that time. Yeah, it's all good. I was still at work. I just thought I was funny as shit. <laughs> and the fact that I didn't get a response. Torch. <laughs> it's funnier that, that I didn't, didn't respond. respond. It's, okay it's it. worse. <laughs> Let me hang it. <laughs> Like a lull would have at least been like a yes, like a little fist bump. But no, nope. can't give you the satisfaction. <laughs> yeah, fuck. I like the comparison point here that we get as well when Lysander is talking with Seraphina about the scar of his youth and which is the one that Darrow gave him in Golden Sun. What do you make of their different approaches between talking about their scars and revenge and sort of the rim versus core dynamic here? Maybe. Maybe it's rim versus core. Maybe that's too much of an extrapolation. I think it can probably be extrapolated in that way a little bit. As we mentioned before in last episode, I think the the rim seems just a lot more feral and a lot more aggressive. So the idea of taking blood packs to kind of 11 on the volume (laughs) scale makes sense. And Lysander, I don't think he's necessarily representative of his upbringing or even his upbringing either from his grandmother or from Cassius. He seems to be going in a completely different path of kind of turn the other cheek. Don't let the past uh, define you. So it's a very interesting comparison, but I don't know. I don't know if it can be. God, I'm talking myself out of it now. I don't know if it can really be extrapolated that way of core versus rim. I think. Yeah, it does feel a little bit character driven. Yeah, I think it's mostly character driven on Lysander's part. I think the revenge kind of trope is uh, born and bred through all of gold. Yes, but taken to 11. Yeah. And that, that's what makes Lysander's response so interesting, right? Is you've got you've got kind of multiple layers. You've got Octavia, who wanted him to remove the scar, but he chose to keep it at a young age as a as kind of a, a memory of the Beast of the Reaper. And then you've got Cassius kind of in the, the imprint that he's left on him, not about the scar specifically, but to like leave the past in the past. And, and that sort of comparison versus like the past that was still is that Serafina presents is very interesting. Yeah. So h- how do you take that as far as him deciding to keep the scar versus his statement now of not letting the, the past define him? I think that Serafina's response could even be read as, I mean, she's younger than him, right? Could be read as juvenile in, in some ways. And I, I guess so. that a lot of the rim might operate on this this level where, you know, remember and, and strike back at those who wrong you. But also, I mean, that's man, when you start to ex- his entire family. Yeah, right. I mean, it's not it's not just a rim thing. Right. But at the same time, I, th- I was just thinking about Romulus in this perspective. And if he knows that Darrow did wrong, uh, it kind of it's kind of bad for him if the rest of the rim acts like Serafina does, you know? Yeah. And maybe maybe there's something there, too, where Serafina is pointing this out because she's like, well, I know I know that they did wrong. And so revenge is the right thing to do. There's just something slightly juvenile about it to me. And so I I feel like Lysander's on the right side of this a little bit. I mean, obviously, personally, I feel like he's on the right side of it. But this is the one thing that's hard to quantify when it comes to the rim is is this certain quality of of honor versus respect, I think, is a, a hard line to really define and you think it'd be cleaner given the way that the rim acts and behaves but with seraphina i think it's just a little juvenile assuming romulus knows which we talked about last week so i'm not going to get back into it but assuming he does know that darrow's to blame it's incredibly mature of him to have decided to keep quiet about it because presumably that was done for the reason of maintaining stability within the room Mm -hmm. So he, he decided he elected not to risk his entire planet civilization. civilization. Yeah, that's probably the right way to put it in a chase of revenge, but rather let it go because 
Otherwise, it's certain doom for everybody. It's, it's it's a strong point inside of this chapter. And glad glad we talked through that. So I love this quote, and I think it's really important to point out here. But anything gentle that lives long hides its stinger well. It's just an excellent quote from Serafina. And it really kind of drives home this idea of kindness and deceit going hand in hand, which is interesting and also feels like it could be a rim thing. Because, I mean, maybe it's just because of all the cruelty they face environmentally that's kind of pushed them in this direction more and more. I, it's it's interesting. What do you make of that? Well, I mean, right around here, he's suddenly aware of how close she is, and she's getting very aggressive with this to catch a predator nonsense. <laughs> she is She is getting a little over the top with it. But to actually be on topic here, I think it's a very good point. I think they're living in... A space, both physically and civilizationally, civilly, <laughs> where uh, softness does not survive. There's a mm-hmm. there's a comment later on from Lyria that feeds into it. I think we have it written down somewhere lower on. They planted us in stones, watered us with pain, and now marvel that we have thorns. I, I think that kind of plays on the same idea that like this is a harsh environment. And if you don't have teeth, you're not going to cut it. Uh, that was a good like third metaphor to mix in there. Yeah, teeth and cutting didn't work that well. But no, it actually. I mean, I all that I meant is like you. What you did is you took two metaphors and then you made a third one <laughs> 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 to to bridge the gap. But I no, I think I think you're right. I I think that it this is a this is a little bit different to me, right? So to me, this reads that people who are particularly kind could be hiding something within their home life. Right. And I think that that this kind of points to that a little bit, like maybe there's some reason that they're secretly cruel that we're just unaware of. And that is an interesting concept to me. Yeah. I don't know that I fully agree with it. It feels very cynical in a way, but this is a society of cynics and people who genuinely behave that way. So it also, it makes sense. It tracks Mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. And as a final note of the chapter, Serafina lets Lysander know full well that they are very trapped and perhaps in worse straits than they were before with Romulus. What do you make of his situation? Well, they absolutely have to up their acting game (laughs) if they want to take that career out of this out of this shitty town. Yeah, no, they're kind of fucked. This is also a prediction, so we'll get into it later, but I think they're going to have to give up some information about who they are. Maybe not both of them, but Lysander potentially as as a way of as a bargaining chip. Like they they have mm-hmm. nothing. Without doing that, they have no way to uh prove their worth in keeping them alive, you know? Without a doubt. That's that's a really tough tough bargain for them. Yeah. Well, yep. they're they're in a tough spot. With that, Damn, we're in a tight spot. <laughs> we get into chapter 34. Darrow. Apollonius Alvali Roth. Oh my god. Just fucking Apple. So we're a couple of weeks removed from when we were last with Darrow and the Hallers have detected a stowaway on board. What do you make of it being Rona, the stubborn little red niece? That was in the uh, engine cabinet. As soon as there was mention of a stowaway or mention of another person on board, I knew it was her. It had to have been (laughs) like, ah, that, that sneaky red, (laughs) sneaky, sneaky red, but it made total sense. She was pissed, but didn't put up that much of a fight. Like, of course this was her plan. It was cool though. Yeah. Like surviving on candy bars in the in the basement hall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. And like ramen. I think there was like a, a bunch of like instant ramen. Yeah. Stuff. Something like that. It's just garbage. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's funny. It's only made funnier, of course, by Severo's comments. The one about the curry, of course, and like she's going to have to clean the toilets <laughs> for, uh, for what she did. And it's going to be particularly bad because tonight's curry and how children are like dogs and you just have to figure out how to speak their language. Both of those are phenomenal, phenomenal quotes. I think one of the things that I really like about this book is how all the howlers are actually here to and present in these small moments, not just Arrow and Severo. Thraxa gets to color the conversation as well, being like, well, I feel like you're being really mean to her. Alexander gets to smile and shoot her. You know, you've got like <laughs> Clown and Pebble earlier and Callaway, the one who actually found her in the first place. You know, it's 
it's all very interesting mm-hmm. and it's nice to get all of the howler perspectives plus the plus even the old mainstays yeah it's it's a whole lot of fun but god damn does it have the potential of getting really really confusing because i'm not that great at keeping straight like who's talking and characters in general I'm not that good at it so keeping keeping it streamlined and knowing like knowing who's talking is going to be better for me so it, it's been fine but i could see it getting messy going forward having all those like prevalent voices yeah what do you straight. what do you make of those prevalent characters though like do you are you enjoying they're them? real you, like they're real like real people with real personalities and motivations and it's super cool to see it all play out like alexander being so embarrassed of like rona hearing about him puking in his suit from Severo and then getting like the little bit of payback and getting the shooter with the what's it called the like spider venom yeah like yeah. that's it's simple it's small it doesn't matter who did it but the fact that it was him pays off something and it's really cool to see yeah yeah it's it's just it's a series of great moments especially even like callaways built out to be this whole character um clown and pebble of course have their interactions and i it's just all it's fun it's good clown and pebble the uh deserting parents right <laughs> yeah <laughs> <Fuck>. <laughs> Jeez. oh man <laughs> and then we get to apple and boy oh boy do we have a lot to talk about with apple what did you make of tongueless though taking in apollonius's silent performance tongueless is a distinguished man of culture and he is sorely missing his top hat hello my baby hello my honey <laughs> hello ragtime girl <laughs> except for it's got to be without a tongue right <laughs> no i didn't expect you to do it <laughs> no it's awful awful it's sadly detongued oh man what a poor poor dude it's interesting too because daryl actually remarks on him being like a man of a, a different obsidian right he's a little bit shorter he appears to be like a man of culture to some degree is and he shorter or is he just skinny i think he's a little bit shorter i want to okay. say he was like six eight or something like that. oh right he's, yeah, he's, he's defined like as a eight. little bit shorter he's yeah. like a scrawny little dude yeah yeah i mean he's scrawny partially because he was also kept in you know yeah well uh prison cell hmm you live and you yeah. learn, right? Sure, sure. <laughs> needs a top yeah. hat. <laughs> what? He just needs a top hat. <laughs> so, I mean, there are so many Apollonius quotes that we're probably going to be talking about here, but there's one that I want to read that I personally really enjoy because I think that it it speaks to kind of a larger picture of things that are timeless and things that survive. So the mastery of music is its own reward. The process by which one's heart is entwined with the masters of old. You do not know the toil, nor could you suffer it. So you will never know the reward of understanding, but by all means dismiss it. If you cannot comprehend art, survive the Mongols. I wager it will survive you. Oh my God. (laughs) I mean, Apollonius is a master monologuer. He is, he's a, he reads, so well on the page he is sickeningly articulate (laughs) it's really cool it's It's almost a cool conversation going on i i mean it's it's so interesting because even the dialogue here between severo and apple is like wonderful and hilarious the way that they kind of have a banter back and forth throughout this section uh with the like self-help monologue the like did you memorize that like line (laughs) and just all of the like various comebacks that severo has and then it also bounces apple like bounces one back at him and it's fascinating because it actually puts severo on the back foot a little bit to the point of where he's kind of like hiding behind darrow (laughs) there's that that self-help monologue that you mentioned he likens himself to being a ship i think that makes him half man half bull and half ship (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> in that sense i i definitely want to talk more about the self-help monologue but that's a fair point he <laughs> basically lays out the ship of theseus and he's like <laughs> i'm the ship of theseus built in the prison and i just i couldn't couldn't help it oh it's God, it was hilarious it's yeah it's it's funny but it's also it's wonderful because you believe that he believes in himself he believes in this insanity 
And well, he also is it, though. Like he, I think he's not lying. <laughs> no, he's not lying, but he's insane. Well, is he insane if he's not wrong? <laughs> That's also true. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Apple makes me feel confused. <laughs> He's such a wonderful character. I think one of the things that also makes him wonderful is he is he is so narrowly defined himself that even when Severo says, like, you boiled people, he goes, no, Tharsis boiled people, you fucking idiot. You got that wrong. I'm a warrior. I would never do that. And that's an interesting personality trait. Also, the fact that Tharsis boiled people is fucking ridiculous. That's so cool. But- <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to feel. I'm imagining it's cool. I'm imagining like forgive forgive the uh, comparison or the descriptor, but people confit, like just <laughs> people boiled in their own fats. I think. Oh, do you think Tharsis ate them? I'm going with no, but maybe the jackal did. <laughs> he fed it to the jackal. <laughs> Best people I've ever had. My compliments <laughs> to the the fucked up chef. 10 out of 10. No, the jackal was dead at this point, but mm. Mm. the uh, poor man, one out for my homie. <laughs> poor one out for <laughs> But uh, I think, no, it's it's Carnus. It's Carnus and uh, Apollonius that were labeled as friends here, drinking buddies, which is also, there's just so many fun facts about Tharsis that Pierce just tucked in, or not Tharsis, about Apollonius that Pierce just like tucked in here which is also interesting where it's like yeah I'm gonna make this villain guy the buddy guy with all my other villains (laughs) (laughs) and also make him next level insane I just want to see a bar scene with all of them there (laughs) and it it feels like we kind of get a bar scene here in the chapter though like I want to talk about the self monologue bit though here before we get there there are some great great lines in the self help monologue do you have anything favorite that stands out to you i just i like that he likens himself to the ship of theseus theseus right Mm -hmm. that is the right way to pronounce it yeah yep i love that story i love that thought experiment do you think he's the same apollonius as what went into the prison i think he has refined himself i think that this is again pierce brown making reference to something without directly making reference you know this is this is him knowing things and writing it into his 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 knowledge, his obsession. But uh, in in that sort of thought experiment, the the question is whether or not it's the same ship after every piece has been replaced. So do you right. think that plays into this at all? I think he's still the same ship in this case. Okay. And that's I think that's kind of what Darrow's getting at, is that he's still at the core, he's still the same person. Not every plank has been replaced, but he is a more refined version of himself. He's less he even he, like obviously the Valley Wrath brothers are known for their their avarices and their uh, tastes for the sort of cultural improprieties. I, I'm totally missing the word here. They really like whorehouses and drugs. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they're decadent. And All I can think about is how much it would suck to live in a house with not one, but two people practicing the violin all the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a fair point. And that's why Apollonius threw away Tactus's violin. That's it. That's yeah. it. That's all. That's why he did it. There we go. Because he wasn't going to be good at it. <laughs> it was just he's like, you're not going to be good. You're never going to be good. And I think at the same time, Apollonius probably would have been like, well, I told you that, and because you quit, you were never going to be good in the first place. And that would also be infuriating if you, like, picked it up. (laughs) Yeah, just all of it. There's no winning against Apollonius, I think, is (laughs) is the nightmare here, at least in dialogue. Apollonius quotes uh, John Milton, Paradise Lost. Uh, the, The mind is its own its own place and in itself can make a heaven or a hell a heaven of hell or a hell of heaven and that that's kind of his entire mantra he goes into the ship of theseus bits of course and the odyssey to remake himself the the line that i really like here is i i read it earlier but i reread the books of my youth with the gravity of age i think that is so interesting because especially now i like to i've been going back and rereading some of the books that i i thought that i really loved And 
either liking them more or liking them less or liking them for completely different reasons. And that's so interesting. The mm-hmm. stand is a completely different book to me as a 27 year old versus a 13 year old. I, of course there's a ton of sex. There's a ton of drugs that are just references that you wouldn't get. And like, there's so much more there in terms of in terms of story to to me that just is an interesting component to say the knowledge of youth with the wisdom of age is an important thing to consider and grow and change mm-hmm. rethink the things that you believed something that can be ta- like isolated and still be meaningful like just isolate i think that m- most idea. of the shit apollonius says yeah. can be isolated and meaningful that's the whole like mongol thing to me like it survived the mongols it will survive you so like you could remove that from the concept of the war <laughs> like i don't know if you have an answer to this sure but obviously lorne is essentially marcus aurelius do you think apollonius is any specific uh philosopher of history no pj he's the antichrist yeah <laughs> no just thinking about philosophers that's interesting or, or a philosophy do you think he embodies a specific philosophy even if it's not an individual philosopher i mean what's interesting is that he acknowledges like hedonism which is a philosophy not just a, like a word mm-hmm. uh, or like a definition of people like hed- hedonism or hedonistic practices are like it's a it's a moral philosophy. It's just one that goes counter to most people's morals. It's um, indulgence, right? Essentially. Yeah, basically on a very base level without like really getting into it. To me, he feels like an insane utilitarian perspective. Yeah, he seems like an insane utilitarian. OK, like just the absolute most extreme version. I don't I just basically to point out, I can't think of someone that I think that he's a direct mirror of in philosophy, but I do feel like he is wrapped up in the idea that well, he's wrapped up in the idea of himself and the things that he can prepare and what he could prepare was his body and his mind. And so he did that so that he could weather the next storm. So, yeah, I mean, all of that just speaks to the utilitarian aspect of being in prison. And I don't think we have another perspective yet. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Am I taking over this podcast now? Like, is is that enough questions that I've asked of you that now I get to keep going? No, you've got your own now. <laughs> Shit. PJ Symposium of Whimsy and Media and uh, whimsy. Media. Media and Whimsy. Yeah, Media and Whimsy. <laughs> if you if you want to hear um, me lead any discussions, uh, join our Patreon where I have, have a show a called PJ Symposium of Media and Whimsy. We, I haven't I haven't actually thought about this. We have to think of a theme for your show. Oh man, there's just there's so much here. Especially the the like your late friend Fabii, for example, they cave to their own desire. Do do any now sing their songs? Does anyone speak their glory? He lets the silence answer. And there's just so much of that. Doesn't Darrow kind of though? No. I guess he really hasn't mentioned Roke much, has he? No. Well, all that I mean is like that's that's like midpoint in the monologue because technically this this monologue is go, goes on for like two pages. We yeah, we were pointing mostly point. to the end of the monologue. Yeah. But he is he's ranting in the beginning of the monologue about the the ship that he was or the ship that someone could be. Yeah. He actually rereading that he's even more the ship of Theseus. OK. Anyway, we've lingered on that for a long time. That monologue is huge and a, a big deal. But here we are. Mm-hmm. So. What do you make of the overall plans that Darrow has with the Minotaur to go after the Ash Lord and allow for him to return to his family for his efforts to retake his estate and basically live on the isolated planet of Venus with the society remnant? The Minotaur is fucking dangerous (laughs) and it's not going to go smoothly. I don't think this is hmm. even if Darrow gets out with his life. I don't think Darrow wholly survives this there's the nessus thing that you talked about being uh centaur driven delayed death of hercules right yep and now there's another tar the minotaur different half Mm -hmm. animal that's uh gonna fuck his day up i think i don't know if he'll survive i kind of think he won't yeah i personally don't think darrow makes it out of the series yeah but well uh that's not really a spoiler I it mean, could be a spoiler. You've read the books. There's a book that doesn't exist. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know if he makes it to the Dark Age. 
Okay, there we go. There's there's a different thought. So I I don't want to I don't want to feed into that. All that I meant is like I want to both be able to answer and not answer your question at the same time. That's the only way I can. So I can say I don't think he makes it out of the series uh, based on those thoughts. So, man, there's just so much pointing into the direction of this being a bad decision. And Darrow seems to be very good at making bad decisions. So he seems to be good at justifying bad decisions. He's also missing the brains of so much of his operation in the fact that Mustang isn't with him. Darrow just bumble fucks his way through like bad decisions. <laughs> like he really does. It's a Everything point. just somehow works out for him and it's going to catch up to him at some point, but he has this like probably false air of confidence. confidence. Yeah. yeah. But bumble fuck. It's a great word. I don't use it enough, but now, now it's on this show too. So you're welcome. I love how in that conversation too, Apple quickly picks up on how many men Darrow must have lost in the Iron Rain to take Mercury. And he just pulls this whole picture together in a matter of seconds. It paints this man not only as dangerous, like you said before, but also as like a brilliant tactician and a genius beyond what our expectations is. This this dude is a literal polymath where Darrow is a machine of rage and war. Apollonius can do everything. He can yeah. do like he just is a genius so i i agree with you but i'm curious if that comment was because any iron rain results in a shit ton of death on both sides i think it was specifically about the shields though how did you deal with the shields how did you deal with the um, battery encampments or something like that oh and that's where it, it became a thing where he was like ah so you dealt with it with an iron rain so that means you the casualties you must have lost a million men and mm-hmm. yeah, it's a little on the nose buddy yep <laughs> a little yep. uncomfortable uh, <laughs> no <laughs> bad no we're okay <laughs> i'm a uh, good i'm a good warlord that's basically what Severo said. <laughs> Shut up. We took it. It's ours. The skies of Mercury are ours. <laughs> I know we've been talking a lot about this chapter, but we get kind of we get the end of this chapter is really kind of the final details of tricking Tharsis and the finer details of what they're planning on doing, giving this large spoil of pinks, of alcohol, of meat that they've been missing because Tharsis has ran the family broke. How Apollonius gets upset at being called the Mad Minotaur, so they come up with a different nickname for him. The whole stage, the whole like plot to stage a coup against the Ash Lord and what that would look like after taking him and you know splitting up the families and whatnot. The whole thing that the three of them in that room having that conversation is fucking incredible. For my own sake, what was the other uh, nickname they ended up coming up with? I, the final nickname was the Minotaur of Mars, I think. But okay. there was one in between that he like kind of like shook his head and he's like, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, the indomitable Minotaur was what it was the second time. Indomitable. Because like huh. indomitable. Indomitable. Yep. Blah, 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 indomitable. Indomitable. Yep. I still fucked it up, but I don't know if it came across. You, you, you did it mostly. I did it mostly. That's a good name, but nobody yeah. can fucking say it. So like he said, better, but not quite there yet. <laughs> How do you feel about apollonius on the whole i guess is the final question oh god i love him he's the best villain i've ever heard (laughs) like it's so fucking cool and uh he's going to fuck shit up like he's going to ruin darrow's life the jackal is fucking amazing as as a villain very smart but he's he's kind of trapped in that interesting intellectual box of sort of the plotter or planner and that's mm-hmm. that's a good place to be. It fits, you know, it fits a number of excellent James Bond villains. It fits a number of great science fiction villains. But Apollonius is something completely different. He doesn't fit any kind of box. Yeah. <laughs> at all. Apollonius is everything. It, it, he doesn't seem to have really a, uh, a weak point, you know? I would say his only weak point that he's ever shown is his ability to trust others, actually, interestingly enough, because it was the it was the Ash Lord that betrayed him in a moment and gave him over to the Republic. Yeah, that was his downfall. That was the only reason that that didn't go his way. Mm -hmm. That yeah, that's a good point. So if anything, that's the only thing that reflects that way to me is sort of his willingness to trust. But which is interesting as a juxtaposition to Darrow, who trusts fucking no one. Yeah. Ever. Well, sometimes. Almost. 
Sometimes maybe a little bit. He Dude trusts trust he issues. trusts people for really fucking weird reasons. Yes. I'm still going with Darrow has trust issues. I still don't think he should have trust Cassius at the end of that book. He wouldn't have <laughs> the book wouldn't have ended the same way. He wouldn't have <laughs> succeeded without it. I get that. But he shouldn't have done it. That was a dumb move. And uh by all accounts, he should have died for that decision. Fair point. So uh, we've got a final note here on this chapter, the final moment, talking about their families, about Fitchner, about the key to the grab bike. It's all a sweet moment to end the week on with all of Darrow's chips on the table at the casino on black, basically just 100% all in on everything. But I think it's also interesting that they have this kind of moment where they do reflect and they do talk a little bit about their family, but less than like a half a paragraph, like they exchange a couple of lines this is kind of what I was talking about earlier, where it's like Darrow fails to be emotionally vulnerable with people for the most part still. Yeah. He does here with Severo, which is the only person that he ever really is emotionally vulnerable with outside of Mustang. But And I I feel like for a very similar reason, here I am kind of contradicting myself a little bit uh, between Ephraim and Darrow. I think for the same reason why... Ephraim takes Zolodon all the time. Darrow doesn't talk about his family because it's going to distract him and he's going to feel too much about it. He needs That's to a really isolate himself. Wow. Great, great point. He is entirely isolating himself to remove himself from those same feelings that he sees elsewhere. Great call. Mm-hmm. Cheers to you. Thank you. Ah, uh, yeah, man, the key. Fuck. All right. Chapter 35 this is from Lyria's perspective, teardrop in the door. You pointed out something that was interesting between our two versions of our books. Yeah. So I, I think it's maybe same worth pointing it out to other people. So there's that. What, what, I'm good. I'm just going to look and see. Can we see what like edition? I've got the first edition. Oh, you have a first edition. I think it's technically a second edition. Okay. Interesting. So for me, it says instead of Lyria... It says teardrop in the door, and then underneath it, it says banquet. And for you, it says Lyria, teardrop in the door. Correct. You don't have Lyria on top of yours, correct? Correct. It just says banquet, or it says teardrop in the door, banquet, right? Correct. No, mine says description first edition in the front. Interesting. What? Okay, so some people have a book that says banquet, and some people have a book that says Lyria, but... Both of them say teardrop in the door. PJ might have just gotten a weird, unique printing... It just seems bizarre to me, given the knowledge that I have of the printing process, but maybe someone else knows more. So let us know. PJ also said, looking at the next chapter, chapter 36, like just looking at the text is also different. But then it do- it's no longer different for the next two chapters of which we just flipped to just to compare. Yep. But interesting. What it, what an interesting divergence here. Hard hitting <laughs> journalism here. Hard hitting journalism. Very expert knowledge. Speculative mm. knowledge, perhaps. Hmm. It's a different show. I'm not on it. (laughs) We're just pimping the shit out of the podcast or Patreon. Okay. So we start this chapter with robots. (laughs) Nero's fear become real. It's, it's just actually really funny because this, this entire series was actually initially criticized. It wouldn't like, well, it's a sci-fi series. Why don't you have robots? And I think it was either the second or third book where Pierce added the like whole Nero's it's definitely in the second book added the whole like Nero's fear conversation which also pointed to the reason that like they keep people in line and sort of like gave back reasoning for like why robots obviously wouldn't fit inside of this caste system in society is because it's all about control it's all about power it's all about subjugation and so now that that doesn't exist robots are real and they they can do things especially Quicksilver's robots robots but are I love real yeah i i love uh the reference to asimov's three laws of robotics here of course it's excellent Mm -hmm. i don't feel like i need to explain that more but if you don't know the three laws of robotics go look it up there's also a zero law and i think there's technically a fourth law or a 3.5 that's really a clarification but yeah he did add on a little bit later but yes I, I think Lyria's reflection on life, on the life that she had and the life that she's left behind is a very important one and one that still impacts her to this day. She even has like PTSD moments inside of this chapter, which also kudos brilliant to you, Pierce, to like make us feel those anxiety, those rushes of anxiety of her remembering being in the dirt. And and those those moments, I just think 
wow for for portraying that Mm -hmm. but it, it still impacts her to this day and i think the act of receiving a gift or even a simple kindness to her really goes a long way and i think that that exposes her character in an interesting way as well i've said way too way too many times <laughs> way 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 yeah she it gives her a whole lot of depth and mm-hmm. it i don't know if it makes it feel more or less like a diary entry again but it definitely adds a level of relatability to the character it's less all in the moment and more her all encompassing description. I don't know. I don't know if that's the right way to to say it, but it just no, I think it, it just fleshes good... her out as a character a little bit more. Yeah, and and specifically the the sort of gift component. What did what did you get about her reaction off of uh, Quicksilver's present and like the embossed card? I think the fact that she was so moved by it and so touched by it is kind of a product of her living in the mines and we we've, we've had a lot of conversations and a lot of passages in the entire series of what it was like living in the mines and what trades had to happen and how how strictly controlled all well any any sort of good any sort of consumable any anything was very heavily controlled so things weren't just kind of given to people it was always mm-hmm. a trade it was always utility. So having having just a gift frivolously is a lot more touching to her than it would be to basically anybody else, presumably. Yeah, I I mean, of course, it, it definitely would. I just think that it's also well, it's not that I just think I think that that lends itself to a strangely powerful moment out of a small gesture that maybe Quicksilver didn't even put time into. And in fact, there was probably someone that did it that wasn't him, you know. Mm-hmm. Maybe Mateo did it, for instance, or maybe an assistant did it, or maybe he's a robot. But even just the idea of being thought of by someone else is almost so foreign to her because of how she's taken care of everyone else in her family that she reflects on here. And all of kind of that trauma that's came with her is really kind of a, a single act of kindness, a single gift means so much to her, which is also why the betrayal of philippe at the very end of this chapter even though we don't get the emotional side initially is just heartbreaking Mm -hmm. yeah yeah (sighs) i like the uh the outside perspective on the high collar conversation that happens here as well it kind of feels like being at a kid's table and listening to the adults talk in a way (laughs) like just the way that's just she doesn't really know she's got no insight onto what's happening for the most part she's trying to figure out who's speaking more than anything else Mm -hmm. but we have this nice sense of dramatic irony and we know these conversations with we're familiar with these characters and we're also familiar with their opinions personally inside of this conversation to me victra seemed like a completely different spitball firebrand explosive personality and way more aggressive than she normally is because normally when we see her it's through darrow's perspective yeah it's normally through darrow and also normally she has other strong personalities to lean on like darrow and severo and right now she's kind of fending for herself a little bit she obviously has mustang there but she when she needs to she she turns it on it's kind of what i'm getting out of this Hmm. any other insights that you picked up from the conversation why is this happening at a birthday party (laughs) (laughs) just fucking enjoy yourself have some cake take a shot of jameson with the birthday boy and uh part of your face off for a little while you know that's a that's a fair point i wonder if jameson's still a brand would wrens own it reds would probably own it yeah they would but lagavulin's still a brand so true although maybe it's just a bunch of old bottles it'd be more than 16 years though they'd be gone Oh man, they wouldn't. I, I can't believe that I made that mental mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I think like they log, did that mention that log- they were that they were old bottles, but I don't think hundreds of. I, I don't think there would be any liquid left after hundreds of years. Yeah, I mean, also like we've discovered alcohol at the bottom of the ocean, right? And it's no good. Like the temperature and the conditions are just awful. So. Where yeah, they found these and the radiation on Earth, then the, the everything else that they've done to it, like the gassing. Yeah, but we're we're a lot better at bottling now than we were back then, as far as keeping <laughs> things sealed. So maybe okay, true, true. Yeah, I don't know. 
it could it could work. We'll have to see when it gets to like 800 years from now. We'll do a revisit podcast, I think. <laughs> a couple hundred years. Yeah. I'm I'm with Virginia. I'm calling her Virginia now. What the in fuck? her thoughts. <laughs> calling her Mustangs just so informal. Also, interesting that Lyria also refers to her as Virginia or the Sovereign, you know? Because she doesn't know the name Mustang. That's yeah. that's an inner circle thing. Yeah. So Virginia and in her kind of thought and dancer and the obviousness of her vetoing the the idea of sitting across the table from the Bologna and accepting this peace treaty and basically locking down the government is exactly what Darrow was afraid of. But the other side of this question is, how is Dancer expecting to win this argument in the long run? How is he expecting to make it through the sovereign and the 50 percent roughly or or 45 percent that don't agree with his position, which is basically what he's facing? I mean, he didn't do it alone, but he organized a rebellion once. He could fucking do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's we know he's capable about him being of it. done with war, but yeah, I mean, he could do it. I guess. Mm-hmm. I, I I mean, okay. So let's say let's let's talk about this in terms of the legislation. Do you think he stands a chance? Is this exactly what Darrow like said it was going to be? Yeah, it's going to be so well defined and concrete. I think he stands a chance. I think it's going to take some some extra tactics, but um, I think he'll I think he has a legitimate chance at it. Publius Ku Caraval, of course, is is in charge of the coppers, but he's referred to as the incorruptible. And I think it's it's interesting that he's obviously been brought over into Dancer's side on the political side of things, as we know from Virginia and Darrow's chapters from earlier and and sort of the conversation that we saw and the way that we saw the speech play out that led to Darrow and everything else that's cascaded from Darrow's perspective. Do you do you believe that he is truly going to side with well, the with uh, with Dancer? If he is truly the incorruptible and he sides with Dancer, then Dancer's right. And that should be the decision making. Fair. I Let's see. What did he talk about last time? Like what was the what was the sticking point that he argued with Darrow with? Publius wasn't so much arguing so much as he was making a statement that they were all complicit in the actions in and action. Yeah, then yeah, I think he'll absolutely said with Dancer. And I believe the way that Dancer was winning him over is the idea of reparations for mid and low colors. Mm-hmm. Which and also speaks to the complicit conversation. I think it's also important to note that he doesn't necessarily have the perspective of uh, a lot of the golds in the room as far as who Julia Bologna is yeah. in, in the same, in the same way. Like there's not the understanding of the familial feuds necessarily. And he also hasn't been subjugated by gold in the past, like a lot of the lower colors are. So him being in the position that he's at kind of gives him Almost an apathetic lens on the entire thing, which maybe is an important view to have in the moment. There's definitely something to be said. I don't know how to answer this. I'm skipping it. Cool. <laughs> uh, and, the, and the reason that I'm skipping it is actually because I'm I don't know if I can without swaying yeah. the conversation. That's fair. So we we move on from the dinner party to Kavax gently escorting, uh, gently saying that Sophocles needs to go out. Please take the fox on the walk, which is what you're here for. And Sophocles goes on a nice pee run, takes a dump in front of a bot. The bot gets upset, <laughs> spits some shit at <laughs> Sophocles. And then we run into Pax, and we have this whole conversation with Pax. Pax is fascinated by racing and drags Lyria over to watch some races. And it's really great. I think the dialogue and tension between the two of them the whole time is obviously building to the culmination we see at the end of the chapter. But what did you think about the first part of their conversation? First part being which? Basically, the the back part being the Lyria Red conversation. The first part being more about the racing packs. Oh, yeah. And sort of no, the, it's super yeah. cool to see him actually passionate about something and how in-depth he's gone into understanding what he's looking at and what he's seeing. It does give me some young Anakin vibes, and I think he's going to do a <laughs> Vader. Oh no! <laughs> he loves pod racing. What can I say? <laughs> no, <laughs> you can't compare this to pod racing. <laughs> what else is it then? Uh, um, just racing. 
<laughs> okay, on hover just, bikes. Well, crafts, perhaps. That makes it worse. Uh, uh, <laughs> that makes it closer to pods. Maybe. Mm, no, they're yeah. like they're like bicycles with thrusters instead of wheels, right? Essentially, they're like motorbikes. Yeah, yeah, it's a grab bike. Looks fuck. Looks a lot Pax like can't a be Vader. Like pod racing vessel. If Pax is Vader, that makes that makes uh, Deanna Emperor Palpatine. Fuck. <laughs> I fucking called it. I fucking <laughs> called it. Secretly, Red Rising is just a Star Wars spinoff the whole time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I also love it. I love how passionate this conversation is and how he like really gets into it. He's a little bit brash and abrasive, and she she's noting that, and she's like, of course, you're you're the sovereign son. This is the way that we expect you, I expect you to be about things. But he's also kind of welcoming in its own way, and he's he's trying not to he's trying not to be gatekeepy, you know? Like as a nine-year-old <laughs> mm-hmm. but you know he's just excited he's enticed he's you know 10 year old nine year old 10 year old i think he's 10 yeah he's 10 hmm. so you or know, when you're 10 if, you're if we're going on seraphina's like timeline he's like 14 or something <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah no he's like 10 but yeah it's 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 interesting for sure it's wonderful we get to the second part of the dialogue of course and that's where things change dramatically and that's where the initial conversation which felt like a depth charge blooms into an explosion and Pax and Lyria have this conversation about what it is to really be a red Pax has this perception of being a red potentially from Deanna from a little bit from his dad who's obviously very absent um, and sort of just experiences learned through other people not experience suffered mm-hmm. and Lyria feels like a lab rat being asked a question and is is very logically offended and broken up by the idea that like uh, sort of the the difference between the redness of them and she even referred he she even calls him a gold and i'm just curious as to what your thoughts were on that well i mean obviously we've had the conversations about like carving and sperms and shit like that like <laughs> we still don't know technically he could be uh, genetically pure gold depending on what happened with that carving where the uh where the balls got manipulated and how but <laughs> i think she obviously pax isn't approaching this conversation with really any any regard to who she is and how she might be feeling um, because it it's never crossed his mind he didn't say it at any like he didn't say anything out of malice he and he's not rubbing anything in her face or anything like that but she is paranoid about it to a certain extent and uh kind of blows up on him which understandable it is understandable but at the same time he's pax has only heard the stories of what's happened he knows that his dad was a red that grew up in the mines and was a hell diver and then went undercover into the gold society and took it down from within that's basically the extent of what he knows as far as the lineage of his dad goes so uh, he, I, I, yeah. yes okay so just to just to tag in what you're saying as it relates to lyria yes that's the, his knowledge of the way his his dad was taught and raised and i agree with you that there's definitely a curiosity but there's a curiosity from a perspective of power that perspective of power being a combination of the sovereign and his sort of um, place in society. I mean, he's the he's the first child of the sovereign. And so he has this ungainly ability to have access to anything and everything that he wants. He even knows Lyria's entire personality profile, which spins the back half of their conversation out of control even further when he starts to reveal those aspects of like, well, I've, I've read your profile and that just makes it all that much worse where it wasn't a genuine moment on like um the genuine quote moment quote with philippe (laughs) (laughs) and it it just makes it that much worse from her perspective and i i can't claim to get that perfectly as you know a white dude but i can understand not wanting to be asked or prodded for those questions from I completely understand Lyria's perspective on this and her her being upset. I get it. But at the same time, 
even the like reading your profile thing, I don't think he necessarily knows that that's not a normal thing. He's a 10 year old kid. He's he's using what he has access to. He doesn't have the worldly understanding of what other people have access to. That's the other part of it that I definitely agree with. It, it, it's a little bit unfair to compare the two because she's an 18 year old adult, you know, mostly. And he's a 10 year old kid. And so they don't have a perfect alignment of knowledge or intelligence. But he he clearly in this situation lacks the emotional intelligence to respect as opposed to just be like, what were the minds like? Which is what it comes off as is right. this sort of like abrasive direct and very painful question that he's not acknowledging the pain of yeah he's not he's emotionally intelligent because he's a 10 year old he's just curious about it and yeah there there are very good points on leary's end but i think she is overlooking the age of this kid that she's talking to well i think that she also assumes that he's high like he is of a high status and so he should have already all of this intellect like he there there's this sort of boundless world and intellect that she believes that the sovereign has that she believes her kid to have that she believes that anyone above her has which is also mm-hmm. why she refers to him as a gold and so that might be some there there might be a little bit of negligence on her side there that's not not being respectful but 10 year old pax is also not i mean a he's a 10 year old but also b he's not perfectly being respectful of yeah her i get which that. is also it feeds into kind of the quote. There, there are two quotes here. Talk about they all want a part of it, a part of the pain that's not theirs. Nod their heads, wrinkle their foreheads. Now they want to, <clears throat> they want to put it to gorge on my pain. And Lyria's pain becomes this real like vestige of humanity and loneliness for her. I can't help but think of her relationship with Ephraim slash Philippe and what they kind of mean to each other in those moments because it feels like a real genuine connection. And she is definitely mentally comparing that relationship with this moment with Pax. And what's so mentally fucked to me a little bit is that if the fake Philippe relationship didn't exist, there would be zero problems. Well, not zero. There would be fewer problems, I think, that she would have in this reaction. I think she'd probably just shake it off and walk it off and walk away. But because she has someone who she thinks actually understands her, she feels even more neglected when she's not understood. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. This has given her the the understanding of what it's like to be heard. So she's kind of uh, become more sensitive to not being heard. Yeah, I like that. And she's got an outlet. You know, if she didn't have an outlet, she might actually consider this 10-year-old. But because she doesn't. She's a little bit more hostile. I'm not saying that I think that this would have gone terribly differently without the whole Philippe interaction, but I do think that there's something there that because someone is so understanding and has been so welcoming, she hasn't realized the gentle kindness that is the bee sting that's about to hit her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the line that we quoted earlier that I think is important that I also just quoted the counter quote of (laughs) is uh, they planted us in stones, watered us with pains and now marvel that we have thorns. And that is a beautiful quote. I think it's it's definitely ranks in the, my top five out of this book. It is magnificent as mm-hmm. it talks about sort of the the callous nature of of repressed of repressed people in general of anyone who feels alone in their own right, yeah, or abused by others, and systematically brought up in a harsh environment. Yeah, it's obviously only made it worse. is a very pretty succinct quote. I like it. But yeah, ties in really well with that stinger, gentle quote from Serafina. Yeah, yeah, it all ties together. We mentioned it earlier. I just mentioned it as well. Yeah. And it kind of it all feeds into each other, especially into the final moment of this chapter here, which is the necklace. They're getting on a ship, Pax, Cavax, a number of the Lions Guard and others get aboard one of the ships and take off into the sky and as they take off in the sky, Lyria's Bacchus necklace is activated. It turns red. There's a red beeping from her chest. Discs, a couple of three micro discs fly out, shooting darts in every direction. And then shortly thereafter, they explode, crashing the ship into the ground with the fate of the passengers unclear before someone begins to cut the door open in a teardrop shape. Yeah. Was it an EMP? Do we know that? Did that, we talk about that So yet? this is... 
This is no, we haven't talked about it. This is actually the toughest part of the chapter for me, not because I don't believe it, but because it's not perfectly clear as to what happens. Oh, wait, there's OK. Then there's a high pitched scream from the device and a pulse like the air being sucked in. Lights go out. Filtration unit silent. Yeah, I would assume it's an EMP. So yep. in the uh, 10 years, EMPs have gotten a lot smaller, mm-hmm. probably not more illegal or less illegal. They're probably at about the same level there, I would think. But that's good to know. Like, it's is it a poison gas that comes out? Is it just darts that come out? Because I thought it, I thought they mentioned gas. It's it's gas and darts. So I think it's just like doing a smoke screen thing to screw them up, and then it's doing to obscure, and then it's doing darts. Okay. In yeah. circles, which is why I think that there are three in Cavax is like charging around trying to hit them. Yeah, but it's can't see. Pretty fucking cool. It's a really cool like description of how it, how it all goes down. A little bit vague. I wish there was more, but it's kind of hard to have more there, you know. Maybe we'll get yeah, some I, more I, retroactively. I think what's so interesting is I think that this is actually this description is almost a victim of perspective because Lyria has no clue what any of this stuff is, you know. Mm-hmm. She wouldn't know that it's an EMP. She wouldn't know what the gas is or what it's doing to her really. Uh, and she wouldn't be able to call out like the military aspects. So again, we're presented this narrow perspective and she doesn't know things. Right. Which just goes back to my very sad reflection on the moment where she is going through that mental interview with herself at the ca- cafe. Yeah. Oh, oh, Lyria. Oh man. Oh, <laughs> oh it breaks me. Any other thoughts? Uh, not right now. All right. Cool. Well, then let's move into your predictions. You have <laughs> three uh, that you have here, one of which I think you said you're just going to cross off. So that's OK. Yeah, it's the so, Ephraim necklace one. I, I yep. was wondering why he had a second necklace, but it's because it's that that's the real one. Yeah, we'll, yep. we'll check that one off the list. So PJ's predictions. Uh, how do our boys, TM, get out of this pickle? I think I've talked about this the last couple times, but I really do. Our think boys, by the way, being Cassius and Lysander. Yes, to, Yes. We've defined them as our boys. At least Lysander, I think, will share his identity a little bit as a means of showing that they have a mutual enemy in Darrow and as a means of offering their services in order to get away. So I know that's a vague answer, but I, primarily Lysander will say who he is truly. All right. Sounds good. The second question that you posed is, does Apple live through the upcoming task? Unfortunately, oh, your answer unfortunately, is unsatisfactory. Yes. Your, your answer is unsatisfactory, which is why I was reading it, because I was like, this isn't <laughs> perfect. Um, I want a little bit more. Why does he live through the I know. upcoming task? Give me, give me a little bit of a reason. Well... Because he's a fucking monster. Of course he's going to live through it. But the unfortunate part is that he's going to live through it and wreak havoc on Darrow's life. He's going to ruin okay. everything for Darrow. So how is he enabled, I guess, is where, where I want to get at. How does he go from being partnered with Darrow to execute this task to then being opposing Darrow? Well, because, I mean, it's inevitable that he's going to be opposing Darrow. They've basically admitted that to each other's faces. But how does he get there? I mean, he's going to be equipped with something in order to uh, take down the Ash Lord. Presumably a lot of some things. Like, he can't just do it alone with his bare fucking hands. Like, he, he has cunning, he has skill, he has strength, he has every, he has everything going for him. And Darrow's just kind of gonna, gonna kind of let him go, complete his task, and then he's gonna have no way of really reining him back in. I know there's the... Uh, explosive in his skull which very suicide squad of him Mm -hmm. very but uh, he's too smart man he's he's gonna wriggle himself out of it and maybe not directly attack darrow but try to regain his uh place of prominence before he got locked up which is going to involve ruining things in darrow's life okay all right any anything else anything else you're thinking about going into next week Here's a, here's a question I would pose in place of your Ephraim question. Do you think there's a chance that anyone in the squad dies next week? The squad? Like Darrow's squad? Ephraim's squad. Ephraim's squad. 
Hmm. Or within the next couple, you know, does anyone in FRM squad die from the job, from the gig? Yeah. I don't know who yet, but yeah, I think okay, there will be got casualties. Three options. The red. What oh, was Dana? his name? Yeah. All right. Yep. All right. Cool. Mm-hmm. I just figured replace the FRM question. All right. So next week we'll be reading chapters 36 through 43. Sounds like a good time. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where we're going to leave you for this week. I did actually find the link to the Patreon. Of course, a big thanks to our producers, Tim and Andrew, for helping us keep the show lights on. If you want to help us keep the show lights on, you can contribute to our brand new Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash words and whiskey. So feel free to check us out there. We've got three different tiers. Some give you extra shows. Some are community content. Some are live AMA stuff. It's it's a great time. It should be a lot of fun. We're very excited. This is our launch week. We've also kicked it off with a contest. So if you follow the rules that we have laid out on Instagram for how to enter, there are two different options. One is leaving us an Apple podcast review as well as your username and all the information there on the comment on the Instagram post. The second way to enter is to join our Patreon. So those are going to be your two different options to enter for a subterranean press dark age so you've got until the end of the month so you've got a full 30 days from june 1st so get to it folks yeah hope to see you there on the back side of that the only other thing to do of course is leave us a review on apple Podcasts. you get entered for the contest this is the time to do it folks if you haven't done it before leave that review leave the comments on the review that's what's important Beyond that, interact with us on Instagram, Twitter. You can find us at Words Whiskey Pod on both. And I love to respond to you guys. PJ does when he can. We are building out more and more content there. We are going to include our drinks leading up to the episode so that you can actually see what we're drinking and potentially drink it with us. That way you can have it at the same time that we do. So when when you're actually listening. So it should be should be a really good time. Other than that, subscribe to our newsletter on our website, wordsandwhiskey.show. We've got some fun stuff that'll be coming out there. Again, the brand new Patreon. And yeah, yeah, that's it. Perfect. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.